Sanbonani, Sanbonani, Sanbonani. Namaste, it is good to be with you. And a wise move. Thank you so much for inviting me. I decided to sit on this side because I was ready to take instructions. And there's a big, big ocean behind me, that Indian Ocean uh, is uh, greeting everybody. But I'm going to go back to my place now and sit down and be able to talk to you. Yabonga. My name is Grinam uh, Shope, and I'm the director of an organization called Grinam Asiko Arts and Heritage Trust. I'm based here in Durban. And um, the most exciting thing about uh, meeting the, the, the team, the exciting, exciting women who are part of Wise Move, I met them at a, a female wave. I think it was uh, two, three years ago. And I had no idea what the wave was going to be like. Was I going to dive into the wave? Was I going to be swallowed by the wave? What was going to happen? But I was so happy to be amongst those women. Um, I'll share a little bit about my journey. I have had many extremes in my life. And coming from a very, very um, loving um, early childhood, I always talk about me being a garden. I was watered with a lot of love. I think the Almighty knew that I was going to meet many problems in life, so I needed to be fortified with love and a lot of stories. So once I was fortified with love and lots of stories and um, walking into that classroom for the first time and feeling like, yes, speak to me, teach me how to read, teach me how to write, I'm ready. <laughs> so it was a wonderful way of starting formal education. But many things were going to happen in my life. I was going to move to different parts of the country and then of the world. But the grandmother who told me stories, the one who taught my imagination to fly, one day when I said to her, we have traveled to so many places, she said to me, think about our little town, which is Hammersdale. And um, she talked to me about Etegwini, Durban, our city. She said to me, our province, KwaZulu Natal. And then she talked about South Africa. I hadn't seen the whole of South Africa at the time, but we had traveled to small towns all over the place. I thought I was such a globe trotter. Man, we had done two hours in that direction, another hour in that direction. I thought we'd seen places. And then my grandmother told me that the continent of Africa is Zwekazile Africa. She called it, I didn't know what a Zwekazile was, but she meant the continent. She said, even the continent of Africa is a small place in a bigger world out there. I thought, well, my grandmother's wise. My grandmother knows things. I should believe her. And she says, there's a bigger world out there. She was probably telling the truth. I had no idea that um, it was a prophecy that the youngest daughter of um, Baba Mshope was going to globe trot, was going to see the world. When people ask me where you have been, where I have been, I always think, let's start with the countries I've never been to. And then we'll um, do the other, the past 35 years I have traveled, I've seen the world. I've worked with the most amazing, amazing people in different parts of the world. And the, the joy of it has meant that I'm always curious. I'm always learning. It has meant that also, I arrived in all of these places without wanting to imitate anybody else, wanting to be me, just good old me. It, it has been okay to be me. When I arrived in, a, in Japan for the first time, I was just nervous about one thing. I thought, how am I gonna tell everybody apart? <laughs> in South Africa, many white people say black people look alike. I don't know, maybe, maybe we look alike. And um, with white people, we think, oh, they've got yellow hair, and the other one's got brown hair, and the other one's got orange hair, and then we, we try and then differentiate. And um, some of them apparently have got different eyes, eye color as well. But when I arrived in Japan, I was so terrified because I didn't want to be embarrassing, to be rude to, to, to my students because I was a visiting lecturer at the Kyoto Saika University. But soon enough, I realized nobody is the same. Everybody's different. They might all be relatively on the short side and have black hair and um, maybe smaller eyes. And I look like my father. So I'll check out how small my eyes are. <laughs> and so everywhere I went, I brought the brand that is the stories of my people, the poetry, the music of my people. I always say I come from the house of song and prayer. 
when we are together in my family, until we start singing, you know, for a fact, we are not together. So that singing has been the glue that keeps us together as a family. It doesn't matter what type of voice you have. And even when I went um, um, over um, towards a cliff, I think, of wondering if my voice was good enough at high school, my reverend at the, at the school, I went to a Methodist church, um, high school, boarding school. I went to the minister and I asked him, doesn't God answer everybody else's prayers? And, and why doesn't God answer my prayer? And uh, the minister wanted to know what was my prayer that needed answering. I said, I need um, a soprano. I need a nice voice. I want a beautiful voice. My voice is ugly. And the minister laughed and then he said, your voice is not ugly. Your voice is resonant. I had no idea what kind of word is that resonant. The typical Glenamclope would have run to the dictionary to check out what is resonant. But I thought the way the minister says it, I can live with that. I can live with it. I just believe him. It's okay. <laughs> I walked out there taller and feeling good and floating a little bit. I didn't know that my voice was going to share the poetry of my people with a sense of dignity, I was going to tell the stories of my people with that resonance and touch so many lives. I didn't know that the plays I was going to write, that the kind of magic from the words of my own people, the ancient wisdoms are going to be carried in this vehicle that is my voice. I didn't know that at the time. I thought God had to sort something out here. There's a problem. My voice is too deep. There's no soprano over here. And uh, nowadays I love my double bass. I'm all right. I'm all right. Uh, Bruce, I'm sorry, man. You just made me feel insecure with that voice of yours, but it's okay. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm very lucky also to have been traveling to so many different parts of the world and meeting people who do different types of work and sharing this and sharing that with me. And I'm always wondering, what can I learn in this country? What can I learn in this country? And when I, I think one of the, the, one of the big um, times when I had to decide if I'm a chicken or an, or an eagle was um, in 1991. 1991, I was um, the first black woman resident director. You know how the newspapers love that. It was in all the newspapers and the magazines and, the, and then the radio stations and whatever. Yes, then I'm talking the first black woman resident director <laughs> in the market. So publicity, publicity, until you had no idea where to hide. And um, then one and a half years later, I did something apparently that annoyed um, certain people and um, also uh, the, the political party that, is, um, that was very, very important in our years of struggle, I come from the years of struggle, I uh, was a freedom fighter as well. They decided that I had done something wrong. I had spoken at a place where I shouldn't have spoken and I embarrassed my country and my what. And the long and short of it is that I was fired. And I've got a lot of people, a lot of friends in the media. <laughs> and my friends wanted the story, chop, chop. Let's get this thing, let's scandal, there's, there's a scandal, there's a what? I said, no, I'm not gonna fight in the press. I was in my apartment, I was seething, I was so angry. I didn't know what to do, but I'm not going to the press, out of the question. And then comes a phone call, a phone call saying, are you ready to come and work with us to run some workshops for us, Vextad Dry in Hamburg? I told them, how fast can you buy the, the, the airplane ticket? I'm ready, even tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I, by Friday, I was in an aeroplane going to the Netherlands, to, 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 to Germany, to, to Hamburg. And I worked like nobody's business. I saved every cent. I, I was looking at another place now. And from that day, I, I knew that there, there was a new beginning. Anger out of my life. Confusion, scandal. How do you spell scandal? I'm on my way. And I got into what was the next chapter of my life. I left the theater world, the full-time theater, into full-time storytelling. And I felt a calling. If you know traditional healers in our part of the world, you don't just suddenly wake up, you think you're gonna be a traditional healer. You get called by the ancestors. The next thing you knew, my storytelling became a calling. And I grabbed it with both hands and I've never been happier. 
I've never been happier. I used to say to my director, my mentor, um, Barney Simon, I used to say to him, even though I was doing so well, I'm collecting awards left and right, I'm being recognized in New York, I'm recognized in, in the UK and all over the place, and in the festival, here I am, and all of those things. I used to say to him, I'm flying with crooked wings. And he said, no, but the audience loves you. I said, yeah, the audience loves me, but I'm still flying with crooked wings. I am I'm so grateful he didn't press me to explain exactly what I meant. But um, I knew something was, was just not right. I wasn't fully belonging in the place where I was. And as soon as I got into full-time storytelling, I straightened up and I began to fly right. I knew that this is where I belong. This is what I'm gonna do for the rest of my life. So I have told stories in the most unlikely places. I've worked with philharmonic orchestras. I've worked with the tiniest people in, in small, small villages in different countries. I have worked in kindergarten. I've worked in high school. I've worked with universities. Storytelling is, is, is like water. It changes shape and form all the time. Storytelling, you, you, you can drink it. You can bathe in it. You can see yourself in it. You can um, you, uh, inhale the vapor. You, you can be healed by swimming in it. You can dive into it. There is so much. It can cleanse you, but it can drown you too. So there's so much to this thing called water. But also, storytelling is fire. It is the kind of fire that can inspire so many people. And when I am asked why I tell stories, I repeat the same answer again and again. I tell stories in order to wake up stories in other people. Because every living being has got a story to tell. That's a fact. That's why I tell stories in order to wake up stories in other people. If I can wake up stories in each person who hears me tell a story, mission accomplished. That's so important. But I like to tell the stories of long, long ago. I like to tell stories of my true life experiences. I like to tell stories of my people's history. Our histories are so rich. There is so much to say about where we come from because the place where you come from matters. Some people think that they come from a small place and then I don't need to mention my hometown and then you are nervous about even your surname because it doesn't sound right. I love my name. I love my family name. When we were young, our parents repeated again and again and again, please don't bring disres disrespect or disrepute to your family name. Don't disgrace your family name because it is who you are. It's what you are carrying. If I arrived in Jaipur at that literature festival and I did disgusting things, people in Jaipur would say, ah, oh, there was a woman here from South Africa from a place called Hammersdale and she's a mshope. And now all the people who are called Mshope are disgraced because of me. And I went to a place called Greenland. Now that's cold. That's not Zulu friendly weather. But um, luckily I'm still alive, I came back. And the different places I have traveled, I hear there's somebody here from Boston. I worked with um, Brandeis University. I didn't know I was gonna get a second trip, another opportunity to go back to Boston because uh, when I went back to, to, to Boston, I went to be a writer in residence at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. I had never heard of uh, Isabella Stewart Gardner before until this letter of invitation arrived. I thought, who was Isabella? I don't know. And I arrived at this place, wow. I remembered Reverend Mutalepule Chabaku um, at, at another empowerment um, conference many years before saying, you are, at the right place, at the right time, for the right purpose, let that purpose reveal itself to you. When I arrived at the Gardner Museum as artist in residence, I was at the right place, at the right time, for the right purpose. Sit down and operation shut up. Focus on your writing, be still. No flying anywhere, no worrying about your watch or what your diary says, just be still, the gift of time, the gift of silence. I can never thank them enough. 
I've been to a few artist residences and I am so grateful for those opportunities because here in South Africa, I have to try and make time for my writing. I have to make time for running the organization, the Namasego Arts and Heritage Trust, where we promote literacy, where we promote um, the, the, the preservation of our heritage and, and, and ancient stories, where we run the Nozingwadi literacy campaign. We've just celebrated the 20 years of Nozingwadi. And Nozingwadi was my great grandmother. And I love the fact that we can honor somebody in my own biological family in this manner. And I love to read. And it looks like a, the, 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 there's something about um, um, a, a, a legacy that, 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 that can be preserved. I feel like I'm carrying the, the, the legacy of this woman that I never met. She used to collect books and whatever had writing on it, put them in a suitcase, and uh, she died without ever learning to read and write. But me, I'm propelling. Um, every, every, every school I've ever visited since we started Nozingwadi in 2001, we have donated boxes and boxes full of books. And we have started libraries that are called Nozingwadi libraries. We renovate an empty room. We wash the walls, we paint, we put shelves, we put tiles on the floor or a carpet. And eventually all the books that we have bought or books that have been donated, we put them in the shelves. When we are done above the door, it's written, Nozingwadi Library. How wonderful is that? She's operating from beyond the grave through me. And I love having to do that type of work. Now, when I turned 60 years old, there was a big birthday party and a beautiful school, uh, the School of the Deaf here in Durban, Volindlebe, they baked my beautiful cake. And then they asked me to give a talk. And I stood up and I gave a talk on my birthday. My friends sang and people danced. We had awesome wheelchair dancers. And then eventually I thought, you know what? I'm making a declaration. Since I'm 60 years old, I'm giving myself the democratic right to say the 24th of October, the day on which I was born, shall henceforth be known as the National Storytelling Day. And applause and applause and applause. And people in government were very worried. Ooh, they didn't know where, what to do with this mad 60 year old woman. <laughs> so the following year, we had a big celebration on the 24th of October at 11 o'clock sharp, sharp. And people in different parts of the country, they were doing the same thing at 11 o'clock. And the following year, we did the same thing even under COVID last year, we had the 24th of October, 11 o'clock sharp, we told stories. And I even adopted a storytelling tree. How nice it is to be grown up again. How, how much do you like to be in your 60s? You just adopt a tree and name it a storytelling tree. Now here in Durban, not far from where I live, I live in a peninsula, a place called Brighton Beach, and um, a little bit to south of Durban. We have adopted a tree in the park. It's a wild fig tree. It's massive. And we tell stories there once a month. People of all ages come. Many people we invite, they say, I'm gonna bring my mother. I'm gonna bring my father. I bring my grandfather, I bring my great grandma. They bring old people. Um, they bring the very young. We see two year olds coming there and listening to stories. I see people in their early nineties uh, coming and listening to stories. Who's this woman? Well, what is she up to? And they are reminded of stories and people phone me late at night. Since we've been under the tree, ha, my grandfather won't stop talking. <laughs> well, thank you, and maybe not so, so we are not so pleased after all. But um, what I'm saying is that the work that I do always uh, makes me reimagine my own story. I want wow. to always reimagine my story. I never stop learning. In my language, we say, umuntu ufunda as a afe. A person learns until the day she dies. And so wow. for me, if I ever stop learning, I wouldn't want to live anymore. I would say, stop the train, I'm getting off. So being invited to this amazing, amazing, wise move society, I'm so lucky. It's a wise move indeed to be amongst you. I'm grateful. And when I'm asked, how come you're so happy? What's all this energy about and what? I tell people, listen, let me let you in on a secret. I live for the vitamin D. And they say, what? You can get it from this camp? Which camp is this? No, man. <laughs> Vitamin D is called vitamin gratitude. I'm grateful for life. I'm grateful for so many blessings. 
I live on mm. vitamin G, ladies and gentlemen, and I hope you too can learn, live on vitamin G, vitamin gratitude, and grab whatever opportunities and go to the next level and the next level, and you'll never stop reimagining your own story. Thank you. Yeah, well.